Welcome back to Area Diesel Service. So today we're going to bring you a new collaborative episode with fellow YouTube creator Scrappy Industries. If you haven't come to us from Sam's channel over at Scrappy Industries, be sure to go over there and tell him that we sent you. Sam is another lover of antique machinery and old iron. Sam has acquired, horse traded, potentially alcohol induced, swapped for a TD-25C bulldozer. I think he traded a TD-15. This is a machine that was probably manufactured around 1970. I think it ran from late 60s through the early 70s. This, I believe, was one of the early builds. Big boy, 60,000 pound machine, something like that. Back up and get a size <laughs> comparison. I'm six foot two. This machine's what? Every bit of seven it's way and a half there. feet? Powered by an international 817B engine. That's 817 cubic inches, 13 and a half or so liters of engine displacement. A real horse for that era. Checking in about 280 horsepower, I believe, is what this thing was rated at. And the problem is she's a smoker. So one thing we do know wrong with this is the turbo or something is kind of scrap because it never stops rolling coal. They were at the Brownsville show pushing some dirt around and this thing was black smoking pretty significantly. That's an indication of improper air fuel ratio, right? He could have been over fueling or he could have been under feeding it with air. Those are the things that would cause black smoke or the common things. And they did some preliminary turbocharger inspection. They think they found what the cause is. Complaint was she's a smoker and the turbo is hard to turn. While the unit was assembled on the machine, they felt like they could see some uh, contact in the compressor stage of the turbos. Initial thoughts, not too bad, all things considered. This is a Switzer turbo of the 4MD family. So Switzer has gone on and since been absorbed by Borg Warner. So one could say this is an early Borg Warner turbo perhaps. 4MD755 specifically, international part number 702505C91, C92, and the Switzer or Borg Warner number is a 148065. Given its age and the potential amount of hours on this thing, it's not too bad. If you watched the last turbo we did for Diesel Creek, his turbo was in considerably worse condition. This one, at first glance, doesn't look too bad. This is what we call the turbine housing, turbine housing, turbine housing. And this is where exhaust gas is first introduced to the turbocharger. This bolts to the exhaust manifold as the hot gases from, from the engine leave the engine. They're routed through here and around this housing and they are introduced to the turbine wheels. It's pitted and it's rusty, but it's not too bad, all things considered. It's got a discharge sleeve, so this is a adapter that slips into the turbine housing. It uses a couple of piston rings to seal it to the exhaust system. It's completely eroded and busted, so that could be a challenge. We'll have to see if we can come up with one of those. The connection where the bearing housing meets the turbine housing is pretty crusty, so we may find this one in the machine shop as well so we can get a good surface back here. The contour where the turbine wheel rides, so this wheel fits up into the bore like so, and the exhaust is first introduced on what we call the tip right here. Contour is fairly pitted. I can see signs of contact where the turbine wheel was hitting the housing. It's not terrible but the turbine wheel definitely contacted the housing. The foot rusted and pitted, but we can clean that up. There's quite a bit of meat left in this thing. I know one of the guys mentioned they were a little concerned. There's a casting defect. There's a pretty good pit in the turbine housing there, but I can feel it. There's probably three-eighths of an inch of meat there, so I don't think that goes through. I don't think we're too scared about the pit. Still need to clean it up. Still need to blast it. Still need to perform the official inspection, but at this point, 
I think we can save that. This is the nozzle ring, drops into the turbine housing. This is what directs the exhaust gas right at the tip of the turbine wheel. It looks okay. Turbine wheel itself, again, we showed signs of contact with the housing and I can feel the tip of the fin is just barely rolled over. So it has in fact contacted the exhaust housing. The journals where the bearings ride, Look to be in good condition. Turbine side piston ring covered in schmoo as per usual, but looks okay. And I can see where the back of the wheel just started to contact. Initial indications are that the thrust system was worn in this turbo. The thrust is what controls the wheel play axially. It was allowing the turbine wheel to get in contact with the turbine housing. Turbine wheel resides in this bore like so. Exhaust housing connects here, compressor wheel onto the common shaft, compressor housing mounts on that. Initial inspection of the compressor housing, the surface where the turbine housing mates up to the bearing housing, it's in pretty bad condition. Not uncommon, but also not good. So what may have happened, you can see that some of this corrosion and rust has kind of built up and grown in between the two housings and a lot of times what we'll see is that'll kind of cock the turbine housing in relationship to the bearing housing and that's what will drive the turbine wheel into contact with the turbine housing. Other than this surface and this significant amount of rust and corrosion it looks okay but you, you won't know until you get it cleaned up and measured and inspected. We may see this in the machine shop as well. We may have to true that surface up. Compressor wheel. So this is what draws atmospheric air in, charges it and feeds it to the engine. And same thing. I can see that these blades are just barely rolled over. So this wheel has also been in contact with its housing. Right, right there, that little where my nails hanging up there's a burr other than that slight burr it doesn't look too bad we can see evidence of where the wheel rubbed the housing other than that area of contact the compressor housing looks to be in pretty good shape i can see that there's pretty significant schmoo inside the housing so this thing's probably been pushing a little bit of oil but that's not necessarily uncommon for a turbo of this vintage with this amount of time on it. Back of the seal plate, I can see some rub marks on it as well. Nature of failure could be a couple of things. We talked about the rust between the two housings potentially misaligning. The other thing, this is the seal insert from this turbo, but this thing may very well have had some deferred maintenance. It's got uh, a classic case of schmoo. Definitely time for an oil change. We find the same stuff in the bearing housing and it's nasty. It's almost to the point of grease instead of engine oil. This is the thrust bearing. Again, this is what controls axial play inside of the turbo. And it shows a little bit of wear, but it's actually in really good shape. Journal bearings. So the journal bearing is what controls radial play in the turbo. So the ID of the journal bearing slips over the turbine wheel. And then the OD of the journal bearing fits inside of the bearing housing. And this turbo will ride in a pressurized film of engine oil. And the journal bearings look pretty good. I see minor indications of oil contamination. Journal bearing is significantly more cooked. So could have seen some hot shutdowns. And I'm seeing the same radial grooving so he's got some grit in the oil no big surprise given the amount of schmoo we saw come out of it no significant wear to speak of journals looked good bearings looked good thrust looks good so i think at this point we're probably going to contribute the failure to the misalignment of the turbine housing and bearing housing due to the amount of rust and scale we're seeing between them so had that not occurred, this thing probably would have continued to run for quite a bit more time. Now we just got to see if we can save it. Parts for this thing, effectively obsolete. 
We can still get service parts, right? The journal bearings, snap rings, piston rings. That stuff's no big deal. But hardware, housings and shafts, you can't just go uptown and buy those today. I've seen it before. We've got the hoard. Maybe there's some hardware there. We've got a tremendous amount of inventory for the last 50 years. Potentially still some of this stuff left out there, but time will tell. We're going to take this back to the turbo shop. We're going to bake these components. Baking them will kind of solidify the schmoo, turn it into dust. We can scrape it off, get all of the crusty stuff off of them throughout the baking process. We'll move them over to blasting. We will blast these housings back clean so that then we can perform an inspection. Primary concern, this bearing housing might be scrap. I just don't know if there's enough good material left on this flange for this housing to register. We're going to have to get the scaly stuff off and do an inspection. We may have to try and scrounge up a bearing housing. The wheels, again, clean up and inspect standard operating procedure, grind these journals undersize, bore the OD of the bearing housing oversize, and then get a new journal bearing that is custom in dimensions to make up those differences, restoring factory clearance specifications, not unlike you would do on, a, on an engine crankshaft, right? A 1010 crankshaft, same thing. Grind the shaft, hone the housing, bigger bearing, restore the factory clearance specification, and then uh, clean up the rest of the stuff, get some parts, and we'll slap this dude back together. We have now finished the cleaning process and a much more thorough inspection and repair. We'll start on the cold side, compressor housing, not much going on here. This housing is fine to go again. We've cleaned it up and inspected the contour where the wheel fits in, the rubbing was very minor. Nothing to worry about there. That component cleaned up, going to be fine. The compressor wheel that fits into the compressor housing did not survive. We've got a reman compressor wheel. This thing has previously lived. It's from a donor turbo, but we have cleaned up and inspected. This wheel is good to go. You can see that we have rebalanced the compressor wheel. One component that we've had to replace ready to go again. The big failure, this is a different bearing housing. Again, the bearing housing on Sam's turbo was very corroded on this surface here. This is the surface that mates up into the turbine housing. It was no good. It was so far rusted and decayed that it would not machine back. It would not pass inspection. It was thrown away. This is also a reman bearing housing, so it has previously lived, but it's in substantially better condition than Sam's. Standard procedure, this bore here where the journal bearing rides fits in this bore, and this bore has been machined and honed. There's two of them. We've done that on both sides, and we also had to cut the seal area oversized where the piston ring rides, cleaned it up, inspected, this thing is ready to go. Turbine wheel, same story. You've seen us do these before. Grind the journal bearing area undersize. So the ID of the journal bearing fits on the shaft. So we've ground this shaft undersize and we've got a custom bearing to take up the machine work. And you can see here fresh balancing marks on the turbine wheel. This is Sam's original turbine wheel, remachined, rebalanced, straightened, inspected, polished, ready to go again. Turbine housing is a challenge on this one. We would have liked to have had a new turbine housing, but not available. This turbine housing, again, blasted, cleaned up, inspected, and it's gonna go again. You can see we faced the foot here to get a good sealing surface. The primary concern is this outlet sleeve. So this sleeve, you can see there's a piston ring here. There's another piston ring on the inboard side and this sleeve is removable, but we opted not to. We didn't take it out because you can't get another one. I know Sam's got some uh, machine tools and machining experience. If he's concerned with this, he's going to have to make that himself, but we know that's something he's capable of. In reality, these aren't sealed perfectly anyway. They literally rely upon the initial leakage and soot 
to finish sealing up these surfaces. We'll leave that up to him as to whether or not he messes with that. If he wants, he can knock it out, make a new sleeve, fit it back in there. But in reality, this would probably be okay. I'm not super proud of it, but again, can't get it. It's got some pitting, uh, but that's to be expected. There's plenty of meat left on the bone. This thing is going to be fine. Those are what we call the five major components. The rest of the components were also cleaned up and inspected. This is the nozzle ring. Fits down in the turbine housing. It's good to go. Snap rings and heat shields. And then we've got a new repair kit. So we're going to put new bearings right. Thrust bearing, thrust collars, journal bearings, piston rings. All of those things will go back together new. I'm going to get out of the way. We're going to let the professionals step in, assemble this thing. We'll stand back and kind of watch, maybe add some comments or narrate throughout the process. So we'll bring you back directly. Let's build a turbo. So we got our kit and we got our oversized or undersized parts as we order them. First thing I want to do is go ahead and put my piston rings on my turbine wheel. This wheel just happens to take two piston rings. Does it take two from the factory, or is that because it's oversized? It takes um, two from the factory. So a lot of times, the factory wheel will just take one piston ring, and the seal area will get damaged, and we'll cut it oversized and drop a second one in there. Yeah. Standard repair in the turbo world. Uh, but this one was factory with two piston rings. So do they live right next to one another? They do. And in, in this model, the 4MV, there is a... A little wall in between them. So they got each have their own groove. Yes, yeah, so they each have their own groove. There's our first piston ring. There's the wall, the groove, and then there's our second one. On the compressor end, it also takes a double piston ring, and I call this piece a slinger. And it is not got a double wall. It's just got they're on top of each other. Yeah, they both right. live in the same groove. Yeah. So do we try and stagger the butts? I do. So I stagger that. So if oil were to happen to make it this far. It has a little bit more of a maze yeah. to try to get through. So same concept as like an engine piston, right? Try and stagger your gaps. So I'm going to go ahead and put this in here. The journal bearings do fit. I just do check to make sure. Uh, all I'm doing is rocking it. If if for somehow we had the wrong bearings, it would show. We would see a lot of wobble there. But we're good. There is a retaining ring down in the journal. I already placed that one down there. It's a little tricky. So I'm Pre oil here. What's your pre lube of choice? Um, I like Lucas oil. I know we have um, other engine oil. I like Lucas because it's thicker. Um, it helps um, when as parts as we're building up parts. It kind of also kind of acts as a glue. Keeps them in place. Keeps them in place. So you dropped it down against a snap ring, put the bearing in, and then it's retained on the top side with another snap ring. Yes, and then on and that little snap, if you would have heard it, would just be making sure that the snap ring wasn't screwed correctly. Got our bearings in. Let's get to these thrust pieces. Got our thrust, our thrust bearing. We're going to have two washers, and then we're going to have a thrust spacer. Um, so we're going to put down one washer, and our thrust bearing is going to sit on top of that washer. So these are the pieces that control the axial play in your turbo, right? Correct. In and out shaft play. There is very small amount of axial clearance, but not enough you can really feel it in a turbo. So that's, that's really one of the layman's turbo inspections in the field. If you can move the shaft axially in and out, yeah. you've got a turbo issue. Yeah. And right. if you can move it radially enough to make the wheels contact the housings, it's also an indication of an issue. So, yes. Um, this setup has a, a cap piece and then some bolts are going to hold everything in place. That is not always the case. Sometimes it's just a snap ring that holds everything, everything down with a seal plate on top of it. It's kind of interesting. There's so many variations of how these things fit and go together but at the end of the day they're all really very similar in, in functionality and, and what they're doing yes and even something like this that's 40 50 years old conceptually not really very different from what you see on modern turbos yeah that's actually kind of a neat thing that i've 
I've kind of liked as learning about turbos over the years is, yeah, something that was done a long time ago, it still works. Or there hasn't been a huge need to change or redesign yet. Lots of uh, tweaks in wheel designs and geometries and oh yeah, uh, but conceptually, turbine wheel bearings, bearing housing, compressor wheel, and uh, of course that's all before it went variable geometry. It got complex then. Yeah, that's yeah, that's where the game changed. I'm just putting in a steel O-ring. When people say, "Hey, the O-ring is out," this is what they assume is the the cause for leaks. Mm. It's usually not. I'm just going to put a little oil in here so it helps get in there a little bit. All right, so here's the retaining ring um, that holds the seal plate down. It holds everything, all the thrust pieces in place. And I like to really make sure it's in the groove. And then when I check is, I should still have some movement here, which I do. So I flip it back over. I already put my heat shield on there. It has a retaining ring as well, holding it in place. The inside of the bearings are dry. So instead of it just being metal on metal dry, I'm gonna go ahead and put some oil on it. It helps kind of prelude the turbo. So the clearances between the journal bearings and the bearing housing, as well as the clearance between the journal bearings and the turbine wheel, are fairly excessive and this turbine wheel rides in a pressurized film of oil so unlike the axial play which you effectively can't feel the clearance you will feel clearance in the journal bearings and shaft and again by design so very important parts the shims those raise the wheel just enough to where hopefully when we torque this down, everything doesn't lock up. What's your torque spec? I am going to take it to 350. 350 inch pounds. You can see as he goes, he's just making sure the thrust doesn't bind up, making sure the wheel doesn't, the compressor wheel doesn't drive down in the back of the seal plate or the bearing housing. So we're able to still move. Awesome. All right, I'm gonna lay this in the turbine housing so I don't forget it later. Now we've talked before, we always mark the orientation of the housings before we disassemble so they go back out in the same orientation. Um, but Sam did tell us he had the housings off, so yes. we don't know if he did that or not. But right, so we did mark it when it came in. Um, this is just another O-ring that helps kind of create a good seal. We, we mark them to the oil inlet, so we're pretty close there. We know that he's going to have to reclock his turbo some. Checking as he goes, making sure nothing bound up. Yeah, I'm just seeing if I can get the wheel to hit. Everything seems pretty good. Flip this now, what we call a super core, over into our turbine housing. All right, so here we go. So you can see on the housing there, he's got a couple center punch marks on the turbine and compressor housing, both lined up with the oil inlet. Taste test. Taste test. So he's trying to side load the wheels, make sure he can't get them to come in contact with the housings, feeling the in play. Give her some pre-lube. Yeah. 
feels pretty smooth. As it should. Yes. Completely freshened up. Yeah, the last thing I do is create a tag. So last step, identification. So we want to put a part number on it. We want to put a serial number on it so we can track back who did what to it, what parts were consumed, what processes were done so that we know in the future if there's an issue, you know, where did the parts come from, what went down. Show you making the tag and then we'll meet you back at the parts counter. Here you have it. Another one saved from the scrapyard, right? So 50-year-old turbocharger off a 50-year-old bulldozer and she's whipped back into prime operating conditions. We didn't bring you along for the full feature, but just like the other million that we've done before, tear it down, clean it up, inspect it, machine it, repair it, throw away the parts that cannot be saved, come up with some new hardware, fresh bearings and seals, and then assemble back together, tag and identify, and back out to another satisfied customer here at Area Diesel Service. As per usual, the million dollar question, what did it cost? So the bill on this one rang up just under a thousand dollars. That's five hours labor at a buck and a quarter for 625. And then the balance of that was the subcomponents, right? Bearing housing, compressor wheel, and rebuild kit under oversized bearings, thousand dollars keep this dude in service. Switzer or Borg Warner unit, again, 50 year old vintage. We're still servicing these components every day. This one, no exception. This will live for another 50 years of life as long as the bulldozer doesn't rot around it. Sam's machine looks like it's in really good condition. This is gonna be a good match. I'm sure this thing is gonna get a lot of usage in the future. We've had some developments. This is the turbo that we rebuilt and sent out to Sam at Scrappy Industries. He ran this turbo for about 15 minutes and then experienced a second turbo failure. One of the values of working with area diesel service is service after the sale. We didn't like to hear this. We don't want anybody to have any issues with any of the products that they get from area diesel service, but this is the real world. Things like this happen. One of the things that sets us apart from the competition or from buying stuff from a website is when things like this go south, you've got someone to call, you've got someone to help you through it. The turbo has failed. It's been removed, it's been returned, it's in this box. We're gonna open it with you and perform at least a preliminary inspection, see if we can get an idea of what has transpired. Put it back on the machine, things seem to work fine for 15 minutes or so, and then she went back to smoking and uh, Turbo got tight on him. So we're gonna open this up and see if we can figure out what's going on. Here it is. So when we get a description of a situation like we've heard here, one of the common things that we will encounter is foreign object damage or foreign object ingestion. They've had the air filtration system off. They've been working on it. Somebody might leave a nut or something in there. Very common thing get a rebuilt turbo, ran fine for 15 minutes. A lot of times what you'll find is ingestion and damage on the inducer fins here. That is not the case. This one does not appear to have ingested anything. Shaft play feels what I would say is normal. I can feel when I'm turning the shaft a tight spot, right? So in just one area of the revolution, one area of the turn. I can feel it just barely getting tight. 
but nothing catastrophic, at least showing up there. One thing I'm noticing here, this is the compressor housing. This is the bearing housing, right? You guys watch this rebuild this. That's what contains the wheels and the bearings. This surface here is still the backside of the bearing housing. And then this is turbine housing. And I can see where the turbine housing and bearing housing meet. There are signs of soot having blown out between those two housings. And you can see it again right here where the clamp meets. Potentially something going on there. We should not be seeing exhaust leaking out. Depending on the significance of the leak, it may have eventually sooted up enough and sealed off where you wouldn't have ever known it anymore, but it's not right. Let's look down at the turbine wheel. I don't see any catastrophic ingestion or foreign object damage, but I can see that the turbine wheel is significantly closer to this side of the turbine housing than it is that side. Potentially the housing is not aligned with the bearing housing correctly. More concerningly, when I turn the turbine wheel, the wheel shifts over in the bore. The wheel's offset and it's shifting, well, all the way around the bore. Something going on there for sure. And again, this soot is an indication that this housing is not seated up against the bearing housing. And I'm getting the same thing on this side. In fact, when I turn the wheel quickly, I can see the end of the shaft is bent. So something has happened certainly didn't go out with a bent shaft, but it's definitely got a bent shaft now. We're going to proceed, at least at the parts counter, we're going to take these clamps off, we're going to split the housings off of it, and we're going to try and get a closer look at the wheels and see if we don't see any further evidence of what's going on. I want to try and be cautious when I take this apart here to see if it was seated correctly. I know that uh, when we rebuilt this, we clocked it in the same orientation that we originally received it, but we also learned that Sam had to take these housings off of the turbo to get it off of the engine. We put it back the way that we received it, but when he got it back from us, it was not the orientation that it needed to go onto the engines. I don't remember which housing he had to play with or if it was both. I can probably tell you, you can see our witness marks here. These divots, these center punch marks, originally would have lined up with the oil inlet and it does not on the compressor side and kind of hard to see in this pitted up housing but there's two witness marks here and they're also not lined up perfectly with the inlet or the drain. When uh, Sam called me and told me about the failure he indicated that he was able to remove it the most recent time without taking the housings off. I don't have a center punch up here at the parts counter but I am going to do the guys in the back a favor. I'm going to put a Sharpie mark on it. They can put a hard mark in it back there. And I'm just eyeballing down to the oil inlet. And I'm just going to put a Sharpie mark on that housing. And then again, same thing back on the turbine housing. And I'm going to write inlet. Some people mark the drain. Some people mark the inlet. I'm going to eliminate the confusion. We've marked both housings in uh, orientation with the oil inlet. We're going to split the compressor stage off first. I don't suspect we're going to see anything here. If there's foreign object damage on the compressor side, it's almost always on the inducer or the inlet, right? If something's going to come in and damage it, it's going to go with the flow of the incoming air, and you're going to see it right here. I don't see any indication there. I do see, again, where the wheel had rubbed the housing, but at this point, we're going to contribute that to a bent shaft. I don't really see anything further there. You can certainly see what looks like very minor wheel rubbing. I do see a little bit of oil back here, and you can see it inside of this cover as well. Oil is certainly not supposed to be there, 
sometimes you'll find oil uh, so he had the he had the drain plug so if there was oil sitting in the turbo turbo was up on the compressor end it's not necessarily unreasonable for oil to leak out past the compressor side seal piston rings and turbos are not perfect seals so it's possible that that's just from shipping with oil in it I'm not going to get too excited about that again oil is not supposed to be there certainly seen that before I got nothing on the compressor wheel looks mint the play feels pretty good I got really no thrust play I can still see the shaft bent when I'm spinning it we're going to try and go in after the, the first thing I want to check that clamp was So I don't know if you caught that. I tightened it first. That clamp was looser than I would have liked to have seen. But again, he may have had the clamp off when he removed it from the engine. And I don't know. I would imagine you didn't pick that up on camera. But as I loosened that clamp, I felt the the cartridge or the center section drop down further into the turbine housing. We'll have to get Sam on the phone and see what the uh, removal circumstances were, but there was definitely, as we're taking it apart now, the cartridge was definitely not seated proper in the turbine housing. I'm looking at the seam. Yeah, I'm going to say it's still not seated proper. Right here is the seam between the two housings. And there's definitely a gap on this side. Not much, you know, 16th, maybe a 32nd. But I'd say we've got an alignment issue there explaining at least the soot leakage. On the exhaust wheel, usually if you ingest something, you find it here on what we call the tip. So this is where exhaust gas is first introduced to the turbine wheel and drives it as such. So if it would have chucked a valve or spit out a piece of the engine, you would find that evidence here. I don't see it. And then the other thing <clears throat> noteworthy, I know we talked about it before, but this uses a vein ring. I don't see any obvious issues with that. There is again some oil and schmoo coming out of this side. The shaft is bent, indisputably bent. I don't know. I can assure you that the shaft was checked for straightness before it went out. Kind of baffled. So they uh, ran the cartridge back to the turbo shop. They're going to split that open and take a look at the bearings and we'll see if we find something down in the bowels of this thing so we'll bring you back step one failure analysis we always take some photographs and document the condition of the unit before we scatter it. we already pulled the end housings off at the counter so now we're back in the turbo shop we're going to take this thing apart and see what the innards look like compressor nut off the turbine shaft compressor wheel slides off the shaft there's the important shims. The shims that set the spacing for the compressor wheel come off. Take another picture. Now, it might not slide out easily. Give the shaft a proper spin there. So, yeah, I mean, hell, that? that's that's farmer bent. That ain't just yeah. That ain't just a oversight. A lot of times the shaft will just pop right out, <clears throat> but being that it's bent. No, no such luck. So, I'm gonna go in deeper. It's gonna fight him the whole way because all the all this stuff's in a bind. So, it's getting there though. So here's our seal plate. Looks like our piston ring has for sure rubbed. This is an obvious thing with a bent shaft. What I'm checking here is to see if the gap in the piston ring is uh, collapsed or if they're touching. There should not be a when they're out, there should be a space. There still is a space. So that's actually kind of shocking. You would generally not have to do no, it that should've, step. <laughs> it should have. Usually you give it a little love tap and it, it wants to pop right on up. See material transfer from here. 
Yeah, and there's not a smell of vision yet, but it stinks. To me, it smells like burnt eggs and hair. <laughs> so, good old sulfur smell. <laughs> Shout out to our friends at Vice Grip Garage. We got burnt eggs and hair. But yes, I can see here, we got material transfer. We got th this is heat. It looks like the furthest piston ring. This one's a double piston ring. The top of this one here. This one's loose, which is okay. It has a gap. The other one still has a gap too, but it's it's seized in there. So that's definitely, it's rubbed here on our seal area. And see more material transfer here. And then the scarring. You can see the temperature where the bearings got hot. Kind of the gold color. That's material transfer from the journal bearings. You'll see that a lot whenever it's a lack of lubrication. These are the thrust components. Yeah, in your other video, we talked about how these are being bolted down to help keep everything in place. Yeah, the first time I saw this turbo, this cavity. It was just sludge. Yeah. I actually ran a cleaner to help break it down so I could get the parts out. Not the prettiest of oil. But you wouldn't say that it was completely starved of oil. I can't say it's starved of oil now. Potentially at some point. But at some point, it, it can it could just be the first 30 seconds, the first minute, the first 10 seconds. And I mean, that is why we do pre-lube to hopefully stop something like this. Yeah, so these are the thrust parts, right? The assembly of these components yeah. are what control axial play. And you can see on both surfaces of the thrust bearing. So there's wear here, matches the wear there. That one goes there. Mm -hmm. and then you'll see some metal transfer right here. Right there, you can just barely see. Right there is a little bit of gold. That's material transfer. So again, the, the axial play felt okay. We thought we were getting quite a bit of radial play. Yeah, so here's our here's our journal bearings coming out. This is what rides on the shaft where we were looking at the material transfer. They're going to be hammered. Yeah. Oil does not look good. And so I marked them to know that this was the compressor side. I can see striation lines. I can see that on the inside as well. So we're talking about these lines that run around the circumference of the journal bearing are indicative of oil contamination. This staining here is just cooked oil. Here comes the turbine side. It's definitely got striations as well. The outside is actually different in color. It's still on the shiny side, but it's not great. The inside, though, you can see um, mines as well. Initial analysis, oil-related failure, lack yeah. of and or poor quality, and uh, we're going to take these parts and do a little bit more thorough cleaning. It's a new day. We're back in the turbo shop. Failure analysis is complete. Originally, you may have seen some of our speculation we were a little bit confused by the nature of this failure upon initial inspection. We thought we may have had a fitment issue between the bearing housing surface and the turbine housing surface. These components, fairly old, we're talking 50 year old stuff, and the fitment is not real good. You can kind of hear it. That should be a smooth machine surface and it kind of binds and grinds. We went back and looked at the footage when we assembled the turbo the first time. It looked like it went together pretty good for us. And then uh, you've probably seen by now the footage from Scrappy's channel. They struggled to get this thing in the proper orientation and to fit and seat together correctly. Because of those situations and the failure, we initially made the assumption that we had an alignment issue and rubbage, and that was the root cause. However, we had another set of eyes take a look at this. I explained the situation, what had transpired, what we had done, what Sam experienced, and um, the, the full process of rebuilding this the first time 
the first question he asked was, did we put the right bearings in it? And my heart sank immediately. What we went on to find was that no, in fact, we did not put the right bearings in this turbo. The initial rebuild process, you'll remember that Sam's bearing housing was toast. We had to scrap it and we pulled a second bearing housing out of the hoard and we utilized that in Sam's turbo. The problem is there was a design change in this bearing housing. They went from what was initially referred to as a single feed bearing system to a dual feed bearing system. Initially the oil came in in a single feed and distributed sideways to the journal bearings. The updated design comes in down from the top and Y's out and feeds each bearing individually through the OD. The problem is that we put single feed journal bearings in a dual feed bearing housing. Not only did the bearing housing design change, when they changed that, so did the journal bearings. This is just an example. The dimensions are incorrect, but you can see this journal bearing has holes drilled around the circumference of the bearing and the bearings that we put in the first attempt did not. When we put single feed journal bearings in a dual feed housing, we effectively blocked off the oil passage that lubricates the journal bearings and the shaft. And if you watched Sam's video, you saw that that resulted in a catastrophic turbo failure. I think he said he ran it for about 15 minutes, which is amazing to me that it made it that long. But you can see the heat was significant. The damage catastrophic. Material transfer. Just an absolute sad day at Area Diesel service. Area Diesel induced failure, right? We botched this thing. We're not proud of it but we are going to make it correct. Doing that has been a bit of a challenge because of the hardware availability issues, but we're gonna walk through what we've done and how we're gonna get this thing put back into shape. First thing, we own it. We made a critical mistake. We starved this thing for oil. We destroyed the turbo. We caused a bad day for Scrappy Industries. We own it, we've learned from it, we're gonna move forward with making this thing right. This bearing housing, these bearing components, this turbine wheel, chuck them in the scrap bin. They are no good. This is the turbine housing from Sam's Turbo. We talked about this face here. In reality, in hindsight, we probably should have rejected this component, but at that time we couldn't find another one and we were left with limited options. The only issue we've got now this turbine housing and the setup on the dozer uses a sleeve to make the connection to the exhaust system. So this sleeve slips in the discharge and it uses a couple O-rings to seal it up. When we were reusing this uh, turbine housing, we opted to leave this crusty component in there because we suspected if we tried to remove it, we would experience this. Given the situation now, we were forced to try and remove it, and as we thought, we destroyed this. We were fortunate enough, after significant scrounging, we did find what is likely the last new turbine housing in existence. This is uh, authentic OEM, brand new, unused Borg Warner turbine housing, specifically for this turbo. To say it was a challenge, to locate would be a significant understatement, but it does not include the discharge sleeve. So before we destroyed this, we did take a number of measurements. We're gonna recreate this. Fairly simple component, right? Take a slug of stock, machine it down, cut some piston ring grooves. We believe we've located the appropriate piston rings and we will have a new sleeve so that we can uh, connect this back to Sam's machines. We were able to locate Again, through significant scrounging, a brand new OEM cartridge. This is what we call a cartridge, center housing and rotating assembly. Some folks call it a CHRA. We were able to locate a brand new cartridge. However, 
This is not the right cartridge for Sam's Turbo. This has the wrong turbine wheel and it has the wrong compressor wheel. It does have brand new bearing housing and all of the internals, the uh, thrust components, journal bearings, piston rings, snap rings, all of those components are brand new. So we're really going to get the bearing housing and the small parts. And what we will also obtain, again, this is the surface that was completely chooched on Sam's Turbo. So we're back to brand new, freshly factory machined fitment. If you remember how that old one fit, now we've got just absolute silky smooth, perfect alignment between these components. What we're going to do, disassemble this, get the, get the incorrect wheels out of it, and then the last piece of the puzzle, again, through significant scrounging, right? This turbine wheel, completely junk, bent, roached. What is also likely uh, the last brand new OEM turbine wheel in existence. Brand new, authentic OEM turbine wheel, fits the housing perfectly. Sam's original nozzle ring, going to be just fine. We will be reusing Sam's compressor wheel. So believe it or not, this thing did not suffer any damage during the failure and Sam's compressor housing. So this is what we should have probably done the first go round. We did not. We tried to save a buck and uh, we created a significant issue. If we hadn't have overlooked the bearing issue, I'm confident this thing would have been fine. This is a uh, perfect solution for what we've experienced here. We're going to bring you along. We'll show you taking the cartridge apart. We'll get the old wheels out of it. We will put it back together with the new turbine wheel, Sam's compressor wheel, and then we'll slap the rest of these components on the cartridge. We'll get back to the machine shop and we'll watch them recreate that sleeve. So I'll get out of the way. We'll get this thing fixed up. All right, so step one, we've got the new cartridge chucked up. We're going to disassemble it. Take the compressor wheel nut off. Slide the compressor wheel off the turbine wheel. This had Loctite, so I just don't want it to go through everything. Pop the old shaft. Mm -hmm. Take the old piston rings off of that shaft. Or I should say new piston rings. Check the fit in the bore, look good. Look good, yeah. Since I don't know how old this is or was, just, just want to make sure myself. Piston rings are back in place. Oh, yeah. Piston ring back in, staggered the butt gap. Yep, give her some pre lube. Yep. Correct size turbine wheel back in the cartridge. I'm going to check the thickness of this shim, which is important. It only has one on there, but the original belt had two. All right, so we measured up the shims, made sure we've got the appropriate stack height. Put Sam's compressor wheel back on this cartridge. Yeah. That compressor wheel did get cleaned up. It did get inspected. It did get rebalanced. So it is good to go. Drop a Loctite. Give her a feel. Feel good? Feels real good. Beautiful. So now we've arrived at a cartridge. You can see we've got the orientation marks. So Those are last times and these are when he came back. Yep. 
So part of the reason that Sam had to change the orientation was because when we got it the first time, he had taken it off the machine in pieces and threw them back together. We didn't realize that wasn't the factory orientation. Now we've gone to the correct marks and we've aligned them with the oil inlet right there. So orientation should be set there. Hopefully when Sam gets this back this time, he doesn't have to mess with the orientation of the end housings. The band clamp. Again, when he's going through all these steps, you'll see him check the spin, make sure everything's still free and lined up correctly. Drop the turbine housing clamp down on there. You can see he's kind of got the, the clamp bolt wedged out holding it open. So when he gets this thing set correctly, gets his orientation where he likes it, we'll just pop that clamp right there. Went right back down where it goes. Now you can see the four dots line up with a sharpie mark and the, they all line up with the oil inlet. Give her a feel. Feels pretty good. A little pre lube. That's pretty much it. Back to a turbo. Completely rebuilt. Many new components. This thing is in tip top condition. We'll pop the tag off. We'll re identify this thing, showing that now it's been iteration number two. Again, providing traceability to how we arrived at this unit. We consumed these new components. And this was the process to get there. We can get back in the machine shop. We'll take a look at this sleeve real quick, and then we'll meet you back at the parts counter. We'll wrap this thing up. So we're here on the old Easy Path, the, the bridge port. This is actually the first piece of CNC equipment that Area Diesel purchased back in the mid-90s. And uh, we've got a piece of four and a half inch OD, three-quarter wall DOM steel tubing, and we're going to make a exhaust adapter sleeve for our YouTube buddy Scrappy Industries. So I've got the ID of it already roughed out and chucked up on the ID and I've got a program made and we're going to turn the OD with the piston ring grooves and then we'll do a partial part off and then I'll turn it around and finish facing it off. Deburr it, put piston rings on it and it should be good to go. Now we're set up, we're getting ready to cut the piston ring grooves in. I've already changed tools to the grooving tool and we're getting ready to fire it up and let her go. So as they say, an expert is only someone who has made every possible mistake in a given field of studies. They also say reputations are based upon honesty and how it is that you take care of your mistakes. And we've taken care of this one. And I can assure you 
that we have learned from what we have done here. In review, we've already discussed it. We've owned what we've caused here, right? We put the wrong journal bearings in this turbo. The first time we rebuilt it, we starved the rotating group for oil and we destroyed this unit. Completely scrap iron, caused a bad experience for a customer and we're not proud of it, but we own it, we did it, and we're making it right, and that's what we're talking about today. The fitment on the old turbine housing and bearing housing was suspect. We probably should have gone to this extreme before. These weren't exactly perfect, but had we not put these incorrect bearings back in here, I don't believe we would have had an issue there. After we cooked this thing, we further destroyed those components and mandated their replacement. When we got a new uh, turbine housing, we knew the first time we wouldn't be able to successfully remove the exhaust sleeve, and we had to get it out this time so we could try and get some measurements off of it. And then we've recreated that sleeve here. You should have seen some of the footage from the machine shop uh, where we recreated this sleeve. It's got a couple piston rings on it. It fits in the bore here, and then Sam's exhaust elbow fits over it there. Properly repaired with the correct journal bearings in it. It feels fantastic. It looks fantastic. Again, to summarize, new turbine housing, uh, new turbine wheel, new bearing housing, all of the internals, again, new and of the latest variety. And then we reclaimed Sam's compressor cover and Sam's compressor wheel. That's where we're at today. We're going to box up the goodness, get this sent back out to Sam so he can get this thing reinstalled, and now we'll get a proper test and see how his new TD25 is going to perform. Million dollar question for the second time. We hit on it before. The first attempt to rebuild this, I think we said it ended up being about a thousand dollars. The initial reason why we didn't go to the extreme of finding all of these different new components was really the expense. Putting the incorrect bearings in the first attempt has cost us significantly. Salvaging those components is not what made that thing fail. We made that thing fail. To do what we should have done the first go round. this repair was almost $4,000. New cartridge, new turbine wheel, new turbine housing, reclaiming those components there. It was expensive. That's what we were trying to avoid. But again, if we would have just put the right bearings in it, we probably would have been okay. First attempt did not work. Customer sent it back and it's on us to make the situation right. So this one goes out as warranty, no charge to the customer. Most common question the last time we did one of these kind of dinosaurs was why not just take and adapt a new modern turbo, something that's much more readily available, something that service parts are easily obtained for. And that's something that we always consider. On this one, we went through a pretty significant amount of time trying to find that solution. The problem is not so much finding a turbo that can do the same thing. That's very easy, right? We know how to specify turbo sizes and wheel dimensions and things of that nature. Finding one to do the job, no big deal. Finding one to fit in the envelope on the engine in this instance was significantly challenging. If you watched the video on Sam's channel, probably the main thing was that there is not a whole lot of room where the compressor discharge aims at and goes into the intake manifold on that engine. The spacing, right, so this is gospel. This is where the turbo has to mount on the engine. So the spacing from the foot to the discharge and also what we call center line, so from basically the shaft to where the compressor discharge is orientated, had to be spot on in his machine. We found uh, two modern Borg Warner turbos where we were comfortable with that alignment, but those turbos would not facilitate the engine, the size of the engine, the horsepower. Anytime we found a turbo, a, a modern turbo, that would handle the application and the engine and the horsepower and the displacement, we couldn't make it line up here without basically adapting this cover to a modern turbo. We kind of uh, moved away from that idea. We did look at it significantly, and then we spent quite a bit more time locating these components. Extremely hard to locate, brand new turbine housing, and then again, we found a new cartridge that had the wrong wheels, and we were lucky enough to find a turbine wheel and get this thing back in tip-top condition. We would have loved to put a, uh, say, an S400 in place of this, but it just wasn't feasible in this application.
All right, so that's a wrap. If you're in need of any diesel engine components, be it turbochargers or diesel fuel injection, engine rebuild kits, after treatment, starters and alternators, what have you, please don't hesitate to reach out and give us an opportunity to earn your business. You can call us at 800-637-2658. You can email us at parts at areadiesel.com. You can log on to our website at areadieselservice.com or you can stop by any of our locations in Iowa, Illinois, or Indiana. If you do find yourself in need, please let us know that you learned of us through this collaborative effort with Scrappy Industries. Mention that to us. We'll drop you a hat or a pair of gloves or a fender cover with your order. So that's it. Thanks for watching.